I have some things to say to you today I want you to carry with you and then some things to ask you to do. Now, there's a difference between volunteerism and mandates that are put forward to people. I don't have a mandate for you. God has a mandate for all of us. The truth of the matter is he's already given the mandate to go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. But in the next few days, we're going to be meeting together and praying together. Most of that will be done while you're away. And making some, some adjustments, moving forward, shifting some things a bit, not changing anything about what we believe or stand for, but assigning responsibilities to some people who are very capable of getting it done. And I want to give you just a little preamble to that while we're talking today. But I want us to pray together that God will guide our hearts and help us have the right spirit, all those things. So let's pray together, may we? Our Father, we do thank Thee that we can talk with Thee, Lord, and declare our dependence upon Thee. And we are dependent, and we give Thee glory and praise that we can trust Thee and never be failed in trusting Thee. It's our faith that needs to increase, our vision, our expectation. Guide us and help us. May we see Thee high, holy, exalted, lifted up, greater than all our need, and just come to thee and rely upon thee entirely. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. I have so many things I want to say, I hardly know where to start. I don't know where to start with some things I want to read to you or read the scripture. I always believe it's best, if possible, to begin with a Bible verse, so let's turn it with us please in the New Testament to the book of Hebrews to the 11th chapter and we're dealing with the subject of faith in Hebrews chapter 11 and we come to a verse that I've quoted hundreds of times hundreds of times from this pulpit but let me read just a bit from Hebrews chapter 11 beginning with verse 1 sometimes when you're speaking you need to get the courage to say what you want to say and that can be something that has to build chapter 11 beginning with verse 1 now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. For by it the elders obtained a good report. Through faith we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God so that things which are seen were not made of things which do appear. Now that's where the whole issue lies. I was reading recently the mission statement of colleges that are famous and now some infamous in America, and you would not have seen any difference in the way they started and the way we started. I mean by that, everything about their mission statement was honoring God and training people to serve the Lord. I'll bring some of those sometime and read them to you. There were people with great faith in God, and the, the object was to honor the Lord, to put faith in God. So many wonderful things are given here. In verse 1 of chapter 11, we find this description of faith, the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. And we find here something all of us need to use as an admonition. For by it the elders obtain a good report. We want a good report with God. The only way to have that is faith. And believing God. And so many wonderful things here through faith we understand. That's an amazing word. We understand that the worlds were framed, perfectly set. They were framed. No man could do that. We're discovering what God has created. We're still discovering what God has created. Somebody said they discovered the internet or discovered the radio or discovered what we can send through the television, that type of thing. We're only discovering what God has put in place. And there's yet things to be discovered. And so God leads us and guides us and he means for all these discoveries to be used for his glory. Through faith we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God. In other words, God spoke it so that things which are seen were not made of things which do appear. That's where our faith is really tested. By faith, Abel offered unto God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain by which he obtained witness that he was righteous, God testifying of his gifts, and by it he being dead yet speaketh by faith, Enoch was translated that he could, should not see death and was not found because God had translated him. For before his translation, 
he had this testimony that he pleased God. And then in verse six, but without faith it is impossible to please him. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. Without faith it is impossible to please him. In other words, nothing we do in the Christian life, no work we attempt for God in the Christian life can be done without faith because that faith is saying we're doing this for the right motive. In other words, if we're doing it without faith, we're doing it without God and we're not doing it for God if we're doing it without God. If we're doing it with the thought of men and not of God, it's not really being done for God. The motive is wrong. If you work here or come here or whatever, the great thing is to learn to trust God and to believe God by faith. I say this just for a point of reference. I remember when I said we wanted to start a college and there was nothing but a piece of ground. We weren't sure we'd even started on this piece of ground but it was something God put in my heart to do. And that thing had been bathed in prayer for many, many years, 13 years as a matter of fact. And I, I died with that. I mean by that I came to a place during that 13 year journey where I thought it could never happen. That's a part of the great outburst of faith. There is a great outburst of faith, but it, I think it, it follows where faith almost, you know, just goes to the grave. When you just believe, just believe this is the absolute hardest, worst thing I've ever had to deal with in my entire life, when it's almost overwhelming to the point you think it is overwhelming, God is about to give you a breakthrough. Because it is what God is doing in your life that in, equips you to receive that breakthrough. Because if you didn't come to the end of yourself, I mean really the end of yourself, then it'd still be something you're trying to do to glorify a man or to please somebody or because you had a good idea. But that's not the way the Lord works. In my life, every, every wonderful thing that has been accomplished has been preceded by feelings of absolute failure and ruin like it's all over. And may God help us with this. Um, that's where faith kicks in. That's where faith begins and when you get to the end of the self. You know, um, we say that the, the devil fights these things, but we're, we're not altogether right. I want you to write this down. If God has you to do something, not only does the devil fight it, the world fights it and the flesh fights it. Your old nature fights it. People sitting right here who need to be instruments in God's work, who need to be used for the Lord's glory. And some will be and some won't be. There's always a handful of people here who are distracted. Someone said the other day when we had a, a fine friend singing, someone commented who was visiting that uh, she was sitting next to two or three students who had their phones out texting the whole time the man was speaking. What, about those? what do you think about those people doing that? Let me ask you, what do you think about those people doing that? What do you think about somebody working on something while somebody's up in this pulpit speaking? Or What do you think about that? I know what I think about it. I think they have no Christian testimony. I think if I had a boyfriend like that, I'd get rid of him. I'd throw him out like bad rubbish. If I had a girlfriend like that, I'd say she's not worth fooling with. You know, It's not her value as a human being, but her interest in God and the things of God. Hey, that's wreck and ruin. That spells, the, that spells a whole lot of things down the line that'll never be right. You're either following the Lord or you're not following the Lord. You're either, you're either excited about it or you're not. There's no middle ground here. The flesh, the old nature, your old nature, your old nature, your old nature, your old nature, my old nature, your old nature, you're going to carry it to the grave and it'll fight everything God wants you to do all of your life. It'll raise its ugly head up and try to fight everything you want to do all of your life. Everything you want to do for God, it's against it. Not just the devil is against it. The flesh is against it. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. There's always a battle there. Somebody's going to say it can't be done. By the way, thank God for people who say it can't be done because that makes you go back to the reserve you have in the Lord and you want to move forward with that. 
that opposition is necessary. You're never going to be strong if you don't have to deal with that. And the whole world system, the trickiest thing going on is the world system. Churches by the, the hundreds, maybe thousands, are imitating the world. And that's an assault against the Spirit of God and the work of God and against faith. And of course the devil, the devil wants us to put our trust in something else other than the Lord Jesus as the object of our faith. But let's just, just establish this. I mean, it all comes from God or it doesn't come at all. You know, it all comes from God or it doesn't come at all in the work of the Lord. It's just, it's just by faith. Without faith, it is impossible to please him. I love this, this simple expression in this, in this verse. The Bible says, For he that cometh to God must believe that he is. You just take those two little words, he is. He is eternally present. That helps you understand everything about the sovereignty of God and understand everything about election, everything about predestination. God is eternally present. The moment in time, whether it's 2001 on April 3rd, you come to the Lord, that's your date. That's your say. I came to God that moment. That was when I chose to trust the Lord of my own will, my own volition. I came to the Lord. But because he is eternally present at that same moment, at that same moment, God doesn't have a past, a present, or a future. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. What a wonderful thing at that same moment when God comes to deal with us. Let me show you something else, just a little background while I'm getting a little courage here. In uh, 2 Timothy, I want you to look at this, please. This is what we're trying to do in this school. In 2 Timothy chapter 2, the Bible says, Thou therefore, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. So where is our strength? Where is our strength to be? Somebody said, well, we got a lot of money, or a lot of people, or a lot of buildings. Well, where is our strength? Now, therefore, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. And the Lord brings that grace. And the things that thou hast heard of me, that's Paul, things. Mr. Thomason, I'd like to get out that list again. Well, remember all those things we found in 1 and 2 Timothy and Titus? Let's get that list out again. I need to get that propagated among people. And the things, those things that thou hast heard of me among many witnesses, the same commit thou to faithful men who shall be able to teach others also. So there are four generations there, Paul, Timothy, faithful men, and others. Don't, don't forget that. Paul, Timothy, faithful men, and others. Write it down, please. Paul, Timothy, faithful men, and others. Write it down. You are one of those others, or you're a faithful person, or you're a Timothy, or you're a Paul. And you keep moving up the ladder. Some day, you girls who sang here a moment ago, maybe you're faithful girls. I pray that and believe that. But you'll have to get somebody who's others singing sometime. And then you'll move up the ladder, and you'll be in the Timothy stage. And you have been have taught been somebody. Then finally, you'll find yourself in the, in the leader part of it. So we're all somewhere in that. All of us are somewhere in that. I've always believed that whatever God gifted us to do and we've developed, we need to teach other people to do for the Lord and for his glory. And then here's the great verse for all we're doing. In 2 Timothy chapter 3, the Bible says in verse 14, but continue thou in the things which thou hast learned. What have you learned? If I gave you opportunity to write down right now, what have you learned? I have a great interest in people speaking clearly and definitely, distinctly. And uh, I, I, I challenge people at times when we're in conversations together, when they start speaking in such generalities, nothing specific. And I want them to tell, no, 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 be specific. What have you learned? I have learned. And then what have you learned? Have you learned one thing, two things, ten things? What have you learned? Because what you've learned, <coughs> you've got to teach other people. Isn't that what the Bible says? And if you can't spell it out, then you can't 
you can't teach other people. So there's this period of time, just like I said a moment ago. Uh, the woman was a little disturbed, told me. I mean, she was hurt, told me that someone was playing with a cell phone while we were having something going on. And I said to her, there's always two or three people like that. You just happen to be seated next to them. There's always people like that. There always have been, always will be. But some of those people become, become totally different when God speaks to their heart, turns their life around. The Lord speaks to us through soft tones now, but the tones can get louder and harder. What once somebody thought they'd do because that's, you know, that stands out, that's different. You know, you do as you please, good. That's your, that's your prerogative. But at some time, you'll understand how rude something like that was, how senseless. And God will speak to you about it. So the process here, but continue thou the things which thou hast learned and hast been assured of. You go through that period as I've taught you and being assured of, knowing of whom thou hast learned them. And may God help us all the way through. There's some other things I wanted to share with you, but I want to read some things to you today and talk about our future. And I hope that will help you. I want you to turn, please, to John chapter 6. Let me give you this one word. The Bible says in verse 22, the day following when the people who stood on the other side of the sea saw that there was none other boat there save that one where into his disciples were entered and that Jesus went not with his disciples in the boat but that his disciples were gone away alone. They're figuring this out, you see. How be it, verse 23 of John 6, there came other boats from Tiberias nigh unto the place where they did eat bread after that the Lord had given thanks. When the people therefore saw that Jesus was not there, neither his disciples, they also took shipping and came to Capernaum seeking for Jesus. And when they had found him on the other side of the sea, they said unto him, Rabbi, when thou camest hither, Jesus answered them and said, Verily, verily, I say unto you, you seek me not because you saw the miracles, but because you did eat of the loaves and were filled. There are people who identify with the Lord for what they can get out of it. I have people occasionally who want to have, who come because they know a church like the church we have can be a place where they can make sales. Occasionally I have to sell, tell people, you don't sell any more knives here. No more Mary Kay. You don't talk about selling automobiles here anymore. You don't talk about selling houses here anymore. You come here to worship. Stop that nonsense. God's house is not a place of merchandise. And those people may, may not necessarily be people who are in this church because of that, but just call, get caught up in it. I can remember no Christian, no honest Christian would ever show a house on the Lord's day. I remember when no honest Christian, sincere Christian would mow a yard or do something on the Lord's day. Well, your generation's totally oblivious to that. You, you have no idea about that. I remember dismissing a Sunday school superintendent in the second church I pastored because he mowed his yard on Sunday. I said it killed his leadership in the church long ago. But now the desecration of the Lord's day is just commonplace. But these people following Jesus around because they wanted something more to eat, more bread. And the Bible says in verse 27, labor not for the meat which perisheth, but for that meat which endureth unto everlasting life, which the Son of Man shall give unto you. For him hath God the Father sealed. I remember someone asking in an interview, with the founder of Chick-fil-A. Why don't you open on Sunday? You can make so much more money. He said, no, if I opened on Sunday, I wouldn't have a business because God would take his hand off of it. Interesting how people think about things, isn't it? Verse 28, they said unto him, 
what shall we do that we might work the works of God? In other words, you perform miracles. What, what can we do? And this is one of the greatest things you're going to read. Verse 29, Jesus answered and said unto them, this is the work of God. Now, you ought to mark that. This is the work of God. Because many times I find myself not doing the work of God. And here I am, a minister and a pastor. And you know, all these things that people tag on to me and identifying me. But I find myself not to be doing the work of God. I find many people in full-time Christian service who are not doing the work of God. I hear all this I have all this nonsense. I have, I have a lot of nonsensical people speak to me, and I get nonsensical at times. And they say, well, I'm not called. Well, you're crazy. Every Christian's called. Every Christian's called. The fact is, it's not that you're not called. You're not motivated. That's the problem. You're not motivated. I'm not motivated to do the work of God. Somebody gets hit and killed. We had a little bumper accident a moment ago, but if somebody gets hit out here and they're dying in the highway, any one of you, any one of you, if the person laying there taking their last breath said, please tell me how to get to heaven, you'd get motivated and you'd do it. You couldn't say, whoa, 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 whoa wait, wait a minute, wait a minute. No, I'm, not called, I'm not called in the ministry. Phooey. If you're a Christian, you can do that, right? Right? Yeah. It's not that you're not called, you're not motivated. He said, this is the work of God. Well, tell me, what is it? That you believe on him whom he has sent. That's what God wants of all of us, to be engaged in a work that brings people to believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. Let me read a statement. This is a mission statement that was honed out, worked on to define what Crown College exists for. The mission, the mission of the Crown College is to train men and women to follow the Lord Jesus Christ and to equip them to fulfill his purpose by providing education in which Christ is preeminent and where the highest academics are united with ministry application for the sole purpose of glorifying the Lord Jesus Christ. This mission continues as graduates of Crown College train others. Let me talk about that just a moment. This is our mission. This is why we're here. You ought to know why you're here. This is why the college exists. To train men and women to follow the Lord Jesus Christ and to equip them to fulfill his purpose by providing education in which Christ is preeminent and where the highest academic, academics are united with ministry. How do you unite academics with ministry? How many of you have ever, ever had a lab or something like that? Uh, when I was a student at the University of Tennessee, in the undergraduate program, I, um, I had anthropology and then I had a lab. When I was at Hiawassee College in the first level of the associate's degree, I had biology and I had a lab. Uh, when I was taking science and, and had geology, I had geology classes and I had a lab. I had someone lecture in geology and then we'd go to the lab at some other time and we'd go over things in the lab and make a more practical approach to it. We'd handle the rocks. We'd talk about the earth's crust. We were assigned to find things and look at things and touch things and do things. Application. Application. I remember my mother wanted me to learn to swim. I went to uh, take swimming lessons at Maryville College. They had an old pool there. And um, they sat us down, told us a few things, and then they put us in the water. <laughs> I mean... I discovered my mother had frightened us all of water. I mean, really frightened us of water. You get in water ankle deep, and she's, oh, you're going to drown. You know what I mean? Just, she scared everybody to death. She was just, and they had seen people drown. My father had someone, a relative that drowned. My mother had seen people drown. So they were sort of whacked out about it. And so I remember when we got to the swim lessons, and they said, now, Get in the water, hold on the side of the pool, kick your feet. And then at some point in time, they'd say, get out in a little deeper water, 
hold your ankles. I want you to learn to, the buoyancy of your body and float and try to relieve some of your fears. Sometimes they'd put you on your back and you'd do this and put, hold you on, on the front and you'd try to swim and then they'd let you go and you'd sink. But you couldn't learn to swim without getting in the water. And you cannot learn to serve God without application. You understand that? Ministry. Let me read the statement again, please. Let me read the statement again. I'm reading this for our faculty. And for all of our students. The mission of the Crown College is to train men and women to follow the Lord Jesus Christ and to equip them to fulfill his purpose by providing education in which Christ is preeminent and where the highest academics are united with ministry application for the sole purpose of glorifying the Lord Jesus Christ. This mission continues in our graduates as they train others. So where do we find the ministry application? Someone want to raise their hand and tell me? Where do we find the ministry application? You cannot have a school like we have without a New Testament church. Because you cannot learn what we have mission purposed for you to learn without applying what you've learned in ministry. Now that ought to cover every area of everything. You say, well, I'm a teacher. Then you ought to be teaching others. You say, well, I, I'm, I've learned a language. You ought to be teaching others. I'm a... I'm a elementary education major than teach others to read. I am whatever you are. I am whatever you are. The ministry application is, is for you. And that's how everything is multiplied. Someone trained, equipped, we, we believe dedicated, who loves God, who has character and um, exemplary behavior to qualify as a, an instructor, a professor stands in front of you in class. All of them. I believe all of them pass that test. So what you're becoming is what they are. What you're doing is what they do. What you're learning to do is what they're doing and saying and teaching. So we don't have one person in front of a class doing it, and that's limited. The whole world has to come and hear that one person. That's not the way it works. The way it works is all of us take that and apply it. All of us. And the same thing is true in preaching and teaching and things we talk about in ministry and talk about in here, the thing I'm doing here. Somebody says, I want, to be a, I want to be a New Testament Christian. I want to serve God, but I don't want to do anything. Well, it's impossible. Then Jesus should never have said go. <laughs> he said just stuck with sit, you know. But he didn't stay with just sit. Arise, go. So this is very important for us to get hold of that you're going back to a place for a few weeks where I pray that you don't tell anybody how much you know or how somebody ought to be getting it done. If you want to be a blessing, just get out and do it. Right? Exactly. Correct? We've always had a, a rule right here. If you nod your heads, we hear it rattling, we'll know that you're listening. So you don't go back and say to your pastor or parents or Sunday school teacher or a friend, well, now we really know how to do things. And please don't use me as a club. Look at me. I'm not a club. I'm a human being. I'm not something to be taken and used to beat other people in the head and say, Brother Sexton said, the pastor said, yeah, 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 yeah. No, don't do that. 
I want you to know about mutual faith, mutual submission, mutual love, and mutual respect. We just go on and on and on about those things. And may God help us. I want you to help me do something. If you believe in it, I want you to help me do something. We say of the college that it is accredited. It is affordable. I'm going to change that word. It is accessible. I'm going to change that word, affordable, to accessible. Okay? Instead of affordable, it is affordable. But is it, it is accessible. And then thirdly, it is advancing. Let's say those three things together, please. It is accredited. Let's say it, it is. Okay. That has to do with academics. And a certain criteria that qualifies. That means constantly you get what you pay for. Now, I'm going to have a meeting with all of these people who sit over here, God willing, on Friday morning at 930. And anything you'd like to share with us in a constructive way to be brought up to improve things, we want you to do that. But I want you to know they have all worked very, very hard to provide the finest education for you. And it's always improving. It's always improving. University of Tennessee, not long ago, was involved in a $360 million project. $360 million project. That particular project was all paid for by the federal government. They just printed more money from taxpayers like you and me and gave it to them. Before that, they were involved in a, a new science thing. They tore out all of their science equipment. Just got new stuff. They get computer updates and everything else. All bought and paid for by the taxpayers. Then they charge for the classes out the wazoo, even for that. But now we're moving fast, approaching to it's all free. Now I want to ask you a question. You're sensible. How many of you are sensible? Would you raise your hand? Good. I appreciate that. I want to ask you a question. In your lifetime, where does the graft change? Where will it change? And what time will it change? When ed higher education is free and taxpayers are paying for it, and taxpayers pay more and more so that, that people can get free education. At what point on that graph will the education cease to be improving in any way because the taxpayers will be in such a revolt because they'll get sick of paying for free education? There's an inevitable collision out there somewhere with this type of thing. You ever heard of taxation without equal representation? You ever heard of that? Have you ever heard of that? You ever heard of that expression? That's why we have a country. That's really why we have a country. I mean, the practical thing. People said, no, 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 no. You're not taking more of our money to do what you want to do with it, and we get no benefit from it. So protecting private education, privately funded education is an absolute essential. Let's imagine you say, God's spoken to my heart, I want to do something for the Lord and your church pastor, leaders in your church, lay people say to you, um, you need to go somewhere to prepare. When they think of here, what do they think about? They need to think that it is academically credible that we really provide an education and we we are constantly having people come as the flag is kept up. They come and want to fly under this. I'm talking to a man now at a, at a renowned college who's a dedicated Christian who is so sick of teaching where he's teaching. Now, I'm not saying he needs to be here. Those are always dangerous things because there are things that go with this other than just classroom things. Because remember, we have application, ministry application. People have to understand that. Some people get the idea that when they want to look at something like this, some people get the idea that it's all about them. It's not all about them. It's all about God and all about us. It's a team effort. 
It's about God's glory and about the whole team, isn't it? But everything, every implication and application of accredited would have to do with everything we have to do that's academically credible. For instance, we're building a creation science lab. If I said it was a science lab, I'd get a broader group of people to understand it. But if I said it's a creation science lab, people would say, you really believe in that? When Woodrow Wilson was the president of the United States, he started a progressive movement. It's in full bloom now. It's in such full bloom now, the earth has replaced God. And the EPA can become the most powerful institution, I may say, in the whole country or the whole world because you can't do that because it affects Mother Earth. You can't do that. So we're not to worship the creation. We're to worship the creator. Wilson went on to say that he thought the Constitution was an ever-growing document because the, the, the founders of the Constitution did not understand Darwinism and evolution, so they could not have been academically credible people. He said that. We have those statements. And he has his, his tribe has always existed. So I'm saying to you, holding the word of God, we need a crown creation science center to teach science from a, from a creationist perspective. Did you know once you get rid of critical thinking, you'll never be able to discover again? Because there are no fixed points of reference. Social sciences today, social sciences have become much more important on college campuses than physical sciences. So much so that we've changed the language that we use everywhere. It's not I think anymore, it's I feel. How does she feel? How does this affect him? All this stuff about safe zones and having, having to pamper people and you know, all this kind of stuff where people won't grow up. And they have a defense saying, you know, when I was a baby, they took my oatmeal away from me, so now I killed somebody because I still had that in my mind. That, you know, I mean, there are people who actually believe that kind of nonsense. And you are in that generation. You're walking among those people. So what have you learned? Every, every application, every implication of, of academic credibility and sound mind is connected to that, to that idea. Even the, the institution we found to work with, we found to work with is a group that was formed by creationists as, as an academically credible institution to put their stamp of approval on people over this one thing. And there's always a reproach in an unbelieving world and the reproach of the devil and the reproach of the old nature, you know, the fight there for people to take a stand on what is truly truth and academically credible according to the word of God. The second word we're going to use is accessible. Accessible. I want you to write that down. You haven't heard that. Accessible. Now, we have many qualified people who are here who understand what that means. And it means just what it says, that the education is accessible. How do we get to it? How does it get to us? And you're living, you, 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 you are in the generation where everything could be more accessible than ever in human history. And it's your turn. What a turn you get. What a turn you get. What an opportunity you have. For example, Donald Trump said the other day, he said, I don't need this press corps. You know, we always have a press secretary with a president and, and they have certain press people and correspondents who come who represent newspapers. Maybe they got a million circulation or maybe they got 100,000 circulation or maybe, maybe they've got 4 million viewers on Fox News. 
He said, I don't need you. For the first time in human history, he said, we don't need, we don't need you people. He said, I have 20 million Twitter followers who get everything I tweet out. Any news we want to put out, we put out on the social media. These other people just come along as sort of a also run. There are people with millions and millions of followers. There are people who listen for what people to say. This is the first time in the history of the world you could sit with a computer anywhere in the world and reach with that kind of information, millions of people. Am I right? So we must say we're going to work on accessibility. It is not only accredited, it is accessible. And I'm going to ask one of our leaders to take over as the point person on this accrediting. Like accrediting is not something you, you, you achieve it's not something you achieve. So, well, now we're accredited. That's not something you achieve. It may be a goal you attain, but you keep pressing that matter to make sure everything is academically credible, right? And we're working at it. The programs are real programs. The, 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 the academics are the things that people truly need. That's why sometimes you've got a professor teaching from notes that are 20 years old or two years old, he needs or she needs to check her sources because they're new things, not new truths, but ways to develop it. For instance, for instance, I saw a computer the other day where they had Bible stories on it. And if you studied the story of Abraham, they would show you pictures of not only the travels of Abraham and the journey he traveled, but you could hit something and you could find the ancient ruins of early Chaldees. You could find the kind of trees that were in the desert or how many miles a, tra a camel could travel in a day. All of that was accessible for one story. Now that doesn't, listen, it does replace the communication skills that people like you need and I need to speak. But all this learning can be enhanced. And we have it, we need to have it accessible then the third word is advancing, advancing. Years and years and years ago, I read where Hudson Taylor said, God is always advancing. Now think about that. Think about that in the 400 silent years between Testaments when there was no written revelation of God's word, but God was advancing. The historian knows and the Christian who knows history knows that every, every empire during that silent period when there was no written revelation of God, contributed something, language, travel, even the postal system that was developed during that, those years. God was advancing. God is always advancing. While we're sitting here, God is advancing. What we want to do is advance with God, right? We want to get on his train and go with him. And so I'm going to have a point person over each of these three things, over the accrediting, academic credibility, the accessibility. How many ways can we get this out? How can we make it more accessible? I remember one day uh, when Mr. Sexton said he's going to make this campus, uh, some make this campus um, paper free. Well, you know, somebody said, well, to you, that's nothing, you know. But can you imagine how many tests we printed and how, many, how much stuff and how, 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 how dynamic a change that was. And we said, um, what, about, what about having access for the computer? When we started the school, there was not even a, a, a laptop computer. There was, there was hardly a computer, a huge computer on someone's desk. I remember the first computer, we got a big, huge, bulky thing and people were frightened of it like it was a monster or something. Well, now you could travel the world with nothing but this, you know? In our church, we're finding applications for bus workers 
uh, through Google Earth where they can push and find an address for anyone. Or we're finding uh, applications that they can put on for texting everybody and every address on this. Advancing. So in, in, in reality, the accrediting and the accessible and the advancing are all together. How are we going to help the people in Kathmandu? We have, the, we have the way to do that now, don't we? How can we go? And I have a meeting in the middle of January. I have a meeting in New England to try to find an agreement about a piece of property there. We can start in New England what we have in England. And we're all praying about that, that God will guide us and God will lead us and we'll have the right people and if we could have that kind of academic credibility there with the accessibility and be advancing, then anything and everything we, we do here can be there and people can help all over that needy area, basically a six state area and some south of there, in, all the way down south to New York City and throughout New England. This is what Crown College is up to. And you, you're a part of all of that. Now, I want you to remember those words. Accredited, accessible, advancing. Say that with me, would you please? And we'll reveal to you the point person for those things. We're starting a new office called the GIFT, G-I-F-T, GIFT Department. And some will be running that office, an individual running that office, where every gift received will come to that office, not the finance office, not the business office, but every gift to that GIFT office. And we're going to see what we can do to encourage people in that GIFT office we're going to connect that gift office with all of our alumni, all of our enrollment. Because in the schools we have here, uh, all of us can benefit from all of these things. Now, I'm going to send you an email. I'm going to read it now. Then I'm going to send it to your phone. How many of you have, uh, we have your phone numbers we can send an email to you? How many of you think it may be wrong? because you may have changed numbers. Would you raise your hand? If you, if you, how many of you think you have that? We have that ability to send you an email. Would you raise your hand? Now, if you think there's a problem, I want you to get the email because I want you not only to act on it, I want you to forward it. How many of you have your pastor's email? Would you raise your hand? Okay. Now, look, not all of you will do these things. I'm just saying I want you to do it. I want you to get his email today. And I want you to have it where you can email him. Because I want you to forward this email to him. How many of you have email of friends? And you, you have at least, you may not send them something all the time, but you could send them something other than family. Would you raise your hand? Good. I want you to forward this email that comes to you to as many people as possible. Now look at me, please, just for a moment. I'm not trying to use you. Lord have mercy. I mean, I have given my life, my very life, and many others have done this too, not just me, to try to have, for what, have what you have here. All I'm asking you is you take this opportunity to help. I'm going to read this to you, and then we'll talk about it in just a moment. I want you to listen carefully to it. I won't be much longer. The most amazing thing has just taken place at Crown College. A dear friend of the Crown College has offered a matching gift for the new Crown School of Trades and Technology up to $750,000. That's right. This person is willing to match dollar for dollar up to $750,000. This 
could mean $1,500,000 toward building the new trade and technology school. Please do your best to give and to give generously. This is your opportunity to double your gift. This urgent message is being sent to those who have a relationship with Crown College. We are sending this to you because we know that you believe in what is being done here and around the world to train people to serve the Lord Jesus Christ. Please go online and here's the place you can go to find more information and also to use ways to give. Thank you for your part in this great effort, Clarence Sexton. Now I'm going to send you that. How many of you receive email on your phone? Would you raise your hand? I'm going to send it to you and I want you to forward it. Not only act on it yourself, if you give $5, it means $10. If you give $20, it means $40. Up to $750,000. We've never had anyone ever do this before. But someone who is greatly concerned, and this is going to help. This is going to help with that Creation Science Center. It's going to help with all things we're trying to do. It's going to help us start programs that we wanted to start. It's going to help us so many things. But all of us need to be on board. Find something of gratitude you have. Maybe say, I, I like the lunches and I'm just grateful to be here. Boom, I'm going to use this and do this. I'm going to send something. And there's a way you can give. You can text a gift. You can send a gift. There are many different ways. We'll, it'll be on the email. But I want you to forward it. Don't let it stop with you. How many of you ever forwarded anything that you received? Would you raise your hand? Then you know what to do with it, Correct. And as many people as you can send it to, and they know they'll get it from you, the better because you have a relationship with us. They have a relationship with you, and many of them have a relationship with us, and this will be a great way to do it. How many of you understand what I've just asked you to do? Good. So I'm going to do that. You're going to get it. Before you leave here tomorrow, you'll get it. When you get it on your phone, open it and send it to as many people as you possibly can. Now, remember this. We are working together here. Some amazing things are ahead of us. We're going to, we're going to jump headlong into this media. Full force, full steam ahead. And God helping us um, we're going to use everything that's available to get the gospel message out and those things that enhance us getting the gospel message out. You want to be a part of that? I believe you do. So let's work together for the Lord's glory. All right?